Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you today on our next to the last session of study in the book of Revelation. Uh, this, uh, the notes this week are excellent by Bob, as usual, and they focus on an area of uh, theology we call dispensationalism. This is the Tim LaHaye and the Left Behind series view that uh, we, will, we will look at the future. And it's about being uh, a book, a book being uh, that we want to be afraid of. Uh, and of course, we don't look at it that way. So I'm going to leave that uh, to you and let you read the notes there. They don't need any explanation beyond that. Uh, in addition, I want to let you know that next week we're going to try something different. Uh, not knowing how long all this is going to go on with uh, social distancing, we're going to try to do a Zoom teaching. And uh, we're going to send out notes on how to do that. You can do this on your phone. You can do it via audio. You can do it by audio and video. And uh, I think almost everyone's got a phone. So uh, it may be interesting and it may be a good way to, to close out this series. And we'll see how that works. You know, I gotta tell you, in some respects, I am kind of zoomed out, but uh, I'm never, never zoomed out in terms of uh, spending time with uh, my dear friends in Christ at the church. I received uh, a little, little poem from uh, Sandy Mueller over at the Casa after she heard the uh, gospel reading uh, on the road to Emmaus, when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus. And she wrote this, and I want to read it to you this morning, because I think it's quite good. And I think it relates to everyone, and I'm going to ask Bob to send it to you. Sometimes I don't know the brows or the hairdo. Sometimes I don't know the eyes I'm talking to. Sometimes it's the hips or the shirt or the stride that I recognized no and the mask cannot hide. Sometimes it's the voice or the hat or the coat, but a lot of times it just gets my goat. Not to recognize who was walking my way two meters apart, and I want to say, their name when I greet them and say hello, but as hard as I think, I really don't know. I don't remember. The hair is too long, or it's white, now not auburn anymore. I give up and speak, making it their turn. Hello, do I know you? And I'm so glad to say, I'd love to be able to see you today. I think this says it all in that we're uh, in the midst of needing social contact. I am frankly uh, quarantined out to a great extent. And you know what makes this pandemic unusual is that if we had another type of catastrophe, we'd be gathering together, supporting each other, helping each other, and having a glass of wine on the patio, so to speak. And we can't really do that today. So we're next week going to take a shot at Zooming together. And we'll see how that all goes. And uh, as usual, uh, if anyone of you want to have a chat, uh, just give me a call. We're happy to talk and, uh, and help each other through, through this difficult time. Thanks and God bless you all. Welcome back to this series on the apocalypse, where we now come to the perspectives that have generated more questions and discussion than anything else I've talked about in this course. I'm referring to the popular scenario that begins when all faithful Christians are suddenly whisked up from the earth into heaven in the event known as the rapture. And this means that the rest of humanity is left behind to face the terrors that occur during the reign of the Antichrist. Those who follow this approach argue that it will be in this coming period of terror that we should expect the plagues of Revelation to hit with devastating results. 
They look for war, famine, and death to engulf the planet. They expect the Antichrist to be a cunning tyrant who will control the world economy and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem on the site where the Dome of the Rock now stands. He's supposed to unleash a campaign of terror against any who stand in his way until things culminate in the Battle of Armageddon. At that time, the scenes of battle will rage across northern Israel and into Jordan until things finally end in Jerusalem with the victory of Christ. You can see why this scenario raises questions for so many people. It blends various parts of the Bible together with some of the places we hear about in the daily news. And in the minds of some, everything seems poised and ready for the devastating conclusion to the present phase of world history. Some of you may have first-hand knowledge of this system of thought, while others know about it only because you've encountered it in the media. But either way, this is the perspective that really dominates popular perceptions of Revelation. Whether people like this approach or not, it contributes to the idea that Revelation is a book to be feared. So what I want to do is to take a look at this system in more detail, and then to ask why it's become so popular. That'll give us a basis for noting the problems it creates and how it relates to the alternatives that seem more promising. The worldview I'm describing here is a form of premillennialism. You remember from the last lecture that premillennialism is a belief system that expects things to get worse and worse until Christ returns in order to defeat the powers of evil and set up his thousand-year kingdom of peace on earth. In the last lecture, I focused on, or focused on the Adventists who tried to determine the exact time of Christ's return. Now, in this lecture, I turn to the dispensationalists who have a sense that Christ will be returning soon, but they refuse to set a specific date. They say that the end could arrive at any time, but they generally don't go any farther than that as long as they simply say that the end could come at any time, they can keep adjusting the system so that as the decades pass, so the system is always up to date. This particular belief system is called dispensationalism because it divides history into blocks of time called dispensations. The dispensations begin with the creation and are to end with the New Jerusalem. And during the time in between, history is moving through the various epochs, one after another. Those who follow this approach believe that prophecy is history that was written in advance. The idea is that the prophetic passages in the Bible constitute a script that must be played out to the letter at the end of the age. They also assume that no single book of the Bible contains the entire script so that various parts of the Bible must be put together, like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. That's the only way that people can see the whole picture. So as I go through the system, you'll find that we'll have to jump from the book of Daniel to the letters of Paul and then to the book of Revelation in order to see how the system works. I'll try to keep it as clear as I can as we go. The form of dispensationalism that I'm describing is about 200 years old. It goes back to a man named John Nelson Darby, who lived in Britain in the early 1800s. For a while, Darby was a clergyman in the Anglican Church, but eventually he left and joined the group that is now called the Plymouth Brethren. If you've never heard of this group, it's not surprising, since it's remained rather small, but Darby's views became quite widely known through a series of Bible conferences that were held in the United States in the later 1800s. And since then, they have circulated widely among evangelical Protestants. Where things really took off was when the evangelist Dwight L. Moody picked up this general approach. Moody was very successful at the large evangelistic rallies that he held in the late 1800s. He wove this ominous sense of a world in decline into his preaching, and it gave greater urgency to his appeal that people should come to faith before it's too late. It seemed to work. 
A couple generations later, Hal Lindsey put this approach into his book, The Late Great Planet Earth. In that book, he wove passages from the Bible together with news headlines from the Washington Post and New York Times. Since he wrote it during the Cold War, he created the impression that the world was rapidly heading toward Armageddon. Many found this quite believable at the time. And Lindsay's book sold millions of copies in the 1970s. After that, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins put the system into a series of novels called Left Behind. And these also sold millions of copies. The Left Behind novels wove dispensationalism into a fictional plot about people who missed out on the rapture and had to survive on Earth during the time of the Antichrist. The novels have all the features of contemporary action movies, complete with carnage on the highways and global conspiracies that have to be stopped. Although people can say the Left Behind novels only tell a story, this series made dispensationalism seem vivid and even compelling to many. It gave a clear sense that this is what the Bible has predicted for the future. This approach has given people the impression that dispensationalism simply follows the outline of Revelation. But that's not the case. If you remember only one thing from this lecture, let it be that the dispensationalist approach is actually based on a theological system. It creates a futuristic scenario by combining various parts of the Bible into a new and distinctive picture. It's not simply a reading of Revelation. Let me show you what I mean. A basic feature of the system is that it makes a sharp distinction between the history of the Jewish people and the history of the church. Over the centuries, Christians have generally thought that they share in the promises made to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But dispensationalists disagree. They insist that the Old Testament prophecies concerning Israel must be literally fulfilled in the national history of the Jewish people. And a key point is the promise of land. According to the book of Genesis, God promised that Abraham's descendants would possess the land that extends from the river Euphrates to the river of Egypt. Since this has not literally been fulfilled in the past, dispensationalists argue that it must be fulfilled in the future, at the end of the age. Only then will God's purposes be complete. They argue that the reason for God delaying in fulfilling the promise is that in the first century, the Jewish people rejected Jesus as their Messiah. So God postponed his promise of the land, and at that time, a church comprised largely of Gentiles came into existence. What dispensationalists are waiting for is for this Gentile church to be miraculously removed from the earth by being raptured up to heaven. That will be the signal that time is moving forward again. And when that occurs, Christ will come soon to establish his kingdom on earth, with Jerusalem as its capital. That will complete God's purposes for the Jewish people and mark the turn of the ages. A key text for this whole system of thought is Daniel chapter 9. That chapter outlines the period extending from the restoration of Jerusalem in the 5th century BC until the end of the age. Daniel says that the period will consist of 70 blocks of time, and each block of time will last for seven years. The dispensationalists say that prophetic history kept advancing through one block of time after the next until there was only one period of seven years left to go. That's when Jesus came. But then, most of the Jewish people rejected him. So God stopped the progression of prophetic history with just one seven-year period remaining before the end. The idea is that God is like the referee at a basketball game. You know that in basketball, the game is supposed to last for a set period of time. 
A game usually consists of four quarters, with a certain number of minutes in every quarter. When the clock runs out, the game is over. But when somebody breaks the rules and commits a foul, the referee will stop the clock for a while. And the game does not really advance until the referee starts the clock moving again. Now, during the time that the clock is stopped, life goes on, of course. The players will move around on the floor, and people in the stands will talk to each other and maybe send a text message. But everyone is waiting for the clock to start so that the final minutes of the game can be played out and we can see who wins. From the dispensationalist point of view, prophetic history has been the great time out since the first century. They will say that all but one of the time periods that were prophesied in Daniel have been fulfilled. There's just one seven-year period to go. So for the last 2,000 years, the world has been stuck in the blank space in between the last couple of verses of Daniel chapter 9. On a personal note, I have to confess that when I look at Daniel 9, it's hard for me to see how we can squeeze 2,000 years into that blank space between the verses. But it seems like quite a stretch. But the dispensationalists argue that it's there. They insist that we have to picture a kind of parenthesis at that point in the story so that we can fit the last couple thousand years in between the final verses of that chapter. Well, back to the plot line. The dispensationalists assume that when God starts the clock of prophecy moving again, that will be when the church will be mysteriously taken up from earth to heaven. To get that idea, they have to shift from Daniel chapter 9 to the end of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. That's where Paul pictures the followers of Jesus being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's a vivid scene. Now, over the centuries, most Christians have assumed that Paul is referring to the second coming of Christ and to the resurrection of the dead at the end of time. But dispensationalists disagree. They think that passage refers to an event that will happen before the end of the age. They argue that Christ will return secretly in order to pull Christians up from planet Earth to heaven in order to save them from the horrors of the tribulation that will occur when the last seven years of history are played out. Popular presentations of the rapture can be quite interesting. People picture scenes in which believers suddenly vanish. Their bodies disappear, and they leave their clothing, jewelry, eyeglasses, contact lenses behind. And the unbelievers are clueless as to what happened. You may have seen the bumper stickers that say, in case of rapture, this car will be driverless. And you can imagine the chaos that will occur on the freeways when driverless cars go crashing into other vehicles and then careen off the road. The result will be a pileup of unprecedented proportions. Now, you may be wondering what all of this has to do with the book of Revelation, which is, after all, the focus of this course. Dispensationalists point out that Revelation uses the word church many times in its first three chapters. That's where John writes messages to the seven churches in the Roman province of Asia. But then they note that the word church vanishes until the last chapter of Revelation. They argue that since the word church vanishes from the text for a while, then the church itself must vanish from the earth for a while. This gives the true believers a sense of assurance that they will escape all the tribulations that occur in the middle of Revelation. They recognize that Revelation does include scenes in which people known as the saints uh, do have to suffer at the hands of the beast. But they insist that these saints must be the people who come to faith during the tribulation rather than before it. 
The idea is that everyone who comes to sincere faith before the tribulation starts will be safely raptured to heaven. That gives people incentive to believe now, so they will be spared the horrors of history that are yet to come. Dispensationalists argue that the central chapters of Revelation outline the final seven years of history on God's prophetic clock. Their basic perspective is that all the visions are to be taken as literally as possible, which heightens the sense of fear that these scenes create. The idea is that in the first part of the tribulation period, people should expect the plagues that come with the opening of the seven seals to occur. You remember that the four horsemen appear, and they bring conquest, violence, famine, and death to the world. From the dispensationalist point of view, each one is a step in the horrific march of events leading up to the end. When the seven seals are over, then the seven trumpets begin. The visions tell of fire falling from the sky and the sea turning to blood. The dispensationalists insist that this is exactly what we should expect to occur. If Revelation says that fire will fall from the sky, then it will. Now, if I can pause here for a moment, let me point out a couple of things. One is that it seems like the advocates of this approach are reading the Bible literally. But it would be more correct to say they are selectively literal. For example, they insist that Revelation is not literally predicting that four horsemen will appear when the seals are open. They recognize that the horsemen are symbolic. They agree that we're not supposed to wait for the TV news cameras to show film footage of four horsemen heading down Pennsylvania Avenue on their way to attack the White House. They agree that the riders are symbolic. It's just that the plagues they bring are literal. Critics of dispensationalism have noted that the shifts from literal to symbolic interpretation often seem arbitrary and don't follow the literary texture of Revelation. Critics also point out that the dispensationalist approach ignores the plot line of the book. Initially, their approach may seem to be straightforward as they move from the plagues that occur when the seals are opened to the plagues that occur when the trumpets are blown. But when we looked at those chapters of Revelation earlier in the course, I noted that the seemingly relentless movement toward disaster is repeatedly interrupted by scenes that are filled with promise. Scenes in which people give praise to God and bear prophetic witness on earth. The scenes of interrupted judgment and visions that are filled with promise play a defining role in Revelation, but they seem to be given little weight in the dispensational system. When Revelation is read as a text in its own right, those scenes play a major role in transforming the book from a text of fear into one that inspires hope. When we return to the dispensational scenario, we find that it draws heavily on the picture of the Antichrist that was developed in the ancient church. You remember that those ancient writers put various biblical passages together in order to create a composite picture of a tyrant who would appear at the end of days. Revelation supplies the image of the beast who dominates the nations of the world and persecutes the followers of Jesus. And the name, Antichrist, comes from 1st and 2nd John. And 2nd Thessalonians contributes the features of the man of lawlessness who enters the temple of God and declares that he is God. The dispensational system takes over this ancient synthesis with little change. Something to note is that, again, the approach is selectively literal. Revelation pictures a beast with seven heads and ten horns, yet no one thinks this is literal. No one expects a seven-headed monster to come crawling out of the Atlantic in order to terrorize the world. Yet when the beast is equated with the man of lawlessness from 2 Thessalonians, things become very literal. 2 Thessalonians says that he will enter the temple in order to declare that he is God. And the problem is that the temple was destroyed nearly 2,000 years ago. 
So some people assume that the Antichrist will have to rebuild it soon so that the Antichrist can enter it and declare his deity there. Needless to say, this creates some interesting debates on the internet as people wonder whether the Dome of the Rock will have to be destroyed for the new temple to be built. And all because the Antichrist needs to fulfill what was said in 2 Thessalonians. As we see this happening, it's interesting to ask why the description of the beast is not literal, but the description of the temple is literal, and to ask whether these passages should even be combined. I noted in an earlier lecture that when the Antichrist tradition was created in the early church, it combined things that really didn't fit well together. Revelation may picture a beastly tyrant, but 1 and 2 John use the term Antichrist for people who have an overly spiritualized understanding of the Christian faith. To combine these things is to create something rather different from what each of these texts conveyed when taken on their own. Since this approach assumes that the Bible is predicting things that will occur at the end of the age, the futuristic perspective assumes that modern readers are better equipped to understand the message than those who lived when the biblical books were first written. The reason is that we are closer to the final events that the Bible predicted. For example, the scenario weaves in a battle scene from the book of Ezekiel, where a mysterious figure called Gog attacks Israel from the north. Popular forms of dispensationalism usually identify Gog with Russia, which makes sense to modern readers in Western Europe and North America who have often seen Russia as a threat. But one wonders whether people in antiquity would have thought that Russia was Gog. What is more, Ezekiel says that God will strike the arrows out of Gog's hand. And in the futuristic reading of this passage, the arrows are usually taken to be Russian fighter jets, which fall from the sky. That interpretation really doesn't seem very literal. And by this point, you can see that it makes a difference whether you interpret the imagery by asking how the ancient readers would have understood it or whether you equate it directly with things from today's news. Dispensationalists assume that the present age will end with the Battle of Armageddon, which is, of course, a name that comes from Revelation. But the system extends the name to a sequence of battles that combine scenes from Isaiah, Joel, Zechariah, and Revelation. Some of the more popular dispensationalist literature will even give you the battle plans on a map to help you follow the action. In the popular imagination, the battle usually involves high-tech military weaponry. But you may recall that in Revelation, only one weapon is actually mentioned. The battle is won by the sword from the mouth of Christ. It's the sword that symbolizes his word. So if that is the weapon that carries the day, I have a hard time picturing Armageddon as an ordinary battle of any sort. Those who have studied the phenomenon of dispensationalism, which I've described here, have had to ask why it has become so popular. They've had to ask why has it appealed to so many for so long. And there are a number of things worth noting. First, this system gives people a strong sense of divine control over history. Those who are attracted to the system see little reason to think that the world is going to become a better place. Those who embraced this perspective more than a century ago were discouraged by the failure of social reform to bring the world closer to the millennial ideal. In the generations that followed, the massive destruction that took place in World Wars I and II only reinforced the pessimism. Things like the strain arising from increases in the world population, persistent poverty, and the degradation of the environment show a world that is spinning out of control. Yet the dispensational system gives people confidence 
that God really is in control. They assume that the Bible predicted that things would get worse and worse. And that's what's happening now. So no one should be surprised. Despite the appearance of chaos, God really does have a plan. And people can know the plan by reading the Bible in the way that the dispensationalists do. Of course, some people are horrified at the idea that God would create this kind of violent script for the future of the world. But the dispensationalist view is that it's better to think of a God who is in control than to think of a world that is totally out of control. From their perspective, the idea that no one is in control is the worst thing to imagine. Against this ominous background, there's a second reason for the system's appeal. It does make a place for human freedom. The system assumes that the course of world history has been set by God, and no one can change the course that the world is going. But the system does allow people to change the way their lives are going. They can come to faith. And when people come to faith, they can be assured that in the future they will be raptured up and saved from the devastation that will strike the rest of the world. The world's future may be bleak, but your future is not. And that's where the hope lies. The theme of the rapture plays a central role in this hope for personal salvation. The rapture gives people the promise of escape from suffering. When the book of Revelation was first written, it called people to persevere in the face of challenges, even when this involved suffering. But the rapture idea changes the emphasis from perseverance to escape, and many find this appealing. It also invites people to see the future of the world as something quite different from their own futures. As a result, this lessens the sense of urgency in making positive changes in the world here and now. A third reason for the appeal is that it gives people a way to make sense of experience in the modern world. Hal Lindsey's book, Late Great Planet Earth, was, notable, was a notable example of this. The dispensationalists had traditionally insisted that the Jewish people must possess the whole land of Israel. When Jewish immigration to Palestine increased because of persecution in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and culminated after the Holocaust with the founding of the State of Israel, dispensationalists saw this as a sign that the millennial age was drawing near. And what is more, the development of nuclear weapons made the threat of destroying the entire planet seem all too real. The scenes of apocalyptic destruction seemed to unfold before people's eyes. And yet, the system remained adaptable. Its proponents always stopped short of setting a specific date for the end, so that as the decades came and went, the system could be updated in light of current events. After the Cold War ended, the attention given to Russia eased somewhat. And when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, new ways were found to give Iraq a prominent place in the drama. And the process of adaptation continues down to the present. Now, throughout this course, I've been working with Revelation in ways that are quite different from the dispensational approach. I've argued that we need to take the literary flow of the book seriously so that we see how Revelation actually subverts our attempts to turn it into a map of history. And the plot of the book actually keeps moving people through scenes of threat and into visions of hope again and again. I've also tried to show that taking the historical context seriously does not need to make the book less relevant for modern readers. I would say that the opposite is true. By asking how the book was relevant at the time it was written can help us see how it remains relevant today. There have been many people who have tried 
to shape this more hopeful and encouraging approach to Revelation. So in our final lecture, I want you to meet some of those who have helped me see how dynamic and engaging the study of Revelation can be. That will be our next lecture.